tell me when. All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Joel Cardella. I'm with uh, Rapid7 Global Services. I'm a consultant. And I'm going to talk to you today effectively about uh, lessons in risk management. And what we're going to do is we're going to talk about the Space Shuttle Challenger disaster. This is the 30 year anniversary of the Challenger disaster. Uh, so framing all of the events that led up to the Challenger disaster in the context of what happened 30 years ago, when you look at it at what we're dealing with today, you're going to find some pretty amazing parallels. So very interesting kind of exploration in learning lessons from the past. Jan January 26, or sorry, January 28th, 1986, at 11.39 a.m., the shuttle Challenger lifted off from the launch pad at Cape Canaveral. This is the 25th mission of the shuttle program. 78 seconds later, the right solid rocket booster had a problem. You can see it there. It detached, it caused a fuel leak, and an explosion of the main rocket tank. 78 seconds later, all hands were lost. That's not what actually killed the astronauts, though. What actually killed them was the impact from falling from that great height. So the, the, it's uh, supposed that the astronauts stayed alive for about three minutes in the cabin before it made impact, but they were likely deceased before they actually hit the water. So what went wrong? Um, there hadn't been a NASA loss of life since the Apollo 1 missions in 1967. This is where uh, Grissom, White, and Chafee were on the, the test pad and the Apollo 1 capsule caught fire and all hands were lost. And when that happened, NASA made a really significant step forward in their, their risk management, especially where it concerned human life. This year is the 30th anniversary of the shuttle missions. This is STS-51L, and this is in memory of the crew that lost their lives in the spacecraft Challenger. So really this is about managing risk. We're going to look at all of the steps that NASA took in their risk management programs, what they did before the program, what they did during, what they did after, and look at how we do those same things today and try to learn from the things that they didn't do and maybe learn from the things that they did do well as well. Um, to start out, let's do a little background. So the shuttle program itself, uh, shuttle program was officially known as the Space Transportation System. Um, it was a US government uh, manned launch space program. Uh, it flew from 1981 to 2011, and it was designed to be reusable. So very much like the SpaceX, SpaceX rockets that we see today, um, this was a reusable platform. And that's really important because once you get reusability in a technology like a space technology, you now have economies of scale where you can leverage it and do things like take people into space, consumerism, things like that. Previously, we were sending rockets up into the atmosphere. The rockets would explode. Then we'd have to wait to build an entirely new rocket system, put our payloads on there, launch it into the space, etc. There are 135 total missions flown. And to date, it's still the only space vehicle to uh, orbit, orbit with a person and land. So the shuttle program, NASA asked for $14 billion in the space transportation system. Congress approved roughly $5.5 billion. So what do you think happened? Well, they took the money. They took the money and, of course, they had to cut corners, right? So they weren't going to not take the money, but very obviously they were underfunded. Even if you can consider they padded their budget somewhat, this is still a significant difference between what they asked for and what they got. And so that's going to cause some design constraints and cause them to rethink everything they did. And that's the first part of what we see in a modern parallel where we say, hey, we need this technology or we need this capability and we ask management for budget, we ask for money, and we don't quite get as much as we, we asked for, so we have to tailor that request and figure out what can we do with what they gave us. Because nobody's not going to take the money. That's crazy, right? You're going to take the money and you're going to do something with it. Um, so let's go back in time from even then. During the Apollo missions, they committed $24 billion to basically putting a man on the moon. There were 400,000 people employed, and it was supported by 20,000 industrial firms and universities. So this is a massive uh, undertaking for us to realize a dream, right? Um, basically, uh, the Mercury capsule could only support one person. And that's a really significant thing because when you only can send one person in space, that person has to be everything. They have to be the pilot. They have to be the scientist. They have to be um, logistics. They have to be everything that you can possibly think of in a space mission. Project Apollo came along, and now we can put three people in a capsule. That's really significant. Now that we can have three people, we can do a lot more, especially with regards to science and experimentation, than we can with one. 
So the big focus is we're going to put three people in a capsule, and then John F. Kennedy said we're going to have a man on the moon by 1969, and we're going to get there before the Russians. That was the big thing. So in February 67, they had the Apollo 1 disaster. As I said, Grissom, White, and Chafee lost their lives. But consider the timeline. Two years later, we have the first manned flight test of Apollo 9 with our three astronauts. And then, just a few months after that, we have the first manned moon landing. So this is really significant, and this plays into how we're managing risk. Because when we look at the successes of the past, or the pressures that put us from there to there in such a short time frame, what's the expectation for the future? Certainly the expectation by management is we're going to keep performing that way or better. Anybody ever heard the phrase, do more with less? That's what this is all about. Do more with less. We've seen you do it in the past, why can't you do it in the future? But you have to understand they had a massive, massive effort behind them to be able to do this. Very significant. So political pressure now is building. And NASA is on the hook between 1969 and when this, the shuttle programs are flying in 1981 to be as successful as they were with the moon landings. Um, I can remember as a kid, like watching this, I, I remember watching the first shuttle landing uh, in school. And it was an amazing thing, seeing the spacecraft come down like an airplane, touch down on a runway, and seven people got out. I mean, it was, it was incredible. It was the most amazing thing we'd ever seen. The problem is, by Shuttle 25, the one that, that exploded, now it's humdrum. Now it's every day. Oh, we've seen that 24 other times, right? So there's a lot of pressure on NASA to not just succeed, but to do well and to kind of perform like trained monkeys for the media. Because the media at this point is sort of questioning, yeah, how much money you're spending on this program? Why don't you have better, uh, better successes? What's going on, right? Shuttle 25, though, was very, very special. And so this is what gave NASA uh, the sort of uh, impetus to do really well. And it was because of this person right here. Anybody know who this is? This is Krista McAuliffe. Krista McAuliffe is very significant in our history because she was to be the first civilian in space. She was part of a program that was actually called the first teacher in space. She beat out about 11,000 other applicants to go train like an astronaut and fly in that mission, mission number 25, STS-51L, and effectively was going to teach a lesson from space. And this was going to be a big deal, right? So NASA now has the limelight again. There's pressures to succeed. They've got Krista McAuliffe, who is a media darling. Everybody loved Krista McAuliffe. She had an excellent temperament. She made the rounds in all the talk shows. When we only had three channels, right? She went to all three major talk shows, and that was a big deal if you hit all three, right? Um, and she, she talked to folks and just, she was very personable. Everybody loved her. She was very, very endear endearing, media darling, America's darling. And again, first civilian in space, very, very big deal. So let's talk about now what actually happened to give you the kind of background, the hindsight in the investigation. And then we're going to go forward and show you the steps that led up to it. So effectively, in the, in the shuttle system, and I know I'm talking really loud. I'm trying to give you a little break there. Um, in the shuttle system, you've got a solid rocket booster, which is this one right here. And in that booster, you have O-rings. These are, these are O-rings right here. Those O-rings are about 35 feet in circumference, and it's made of rubber. And the point of an O-ring is to create a seal. So when you are experiencing pressures, pressure changes or flexing or things like that, that rubber seal can fill any gaps that would happen during that flex. Well, the, the problem is rubber has particular qualities, of which we're all aware, I'm sure, and that morning, which is space flight morning, this is a picture of icicles that are hanging off of the gantries. Now keep in mind, this is Cape Canaveral, Florida, right? It's 29 degrees outside. We have icicles hanging off of, off of the rigging. This was a year that the orange crops were decimated by, by a winter. So it was a very harsh and severe winter. So this is very, very significant. When the shuttle takes off, those solid rocket boosters that the shuttle is turning as it's climbing in midair, those solid rocket boosters are turning, and the O-rings, which are designed to snap back in milliseconds and fill those gaps, are simply not doing their job. And as you can see right there, that's where it started, and then the rest is after the explosion happened. So the big question is, why didn't anybody think of this? Why didn't they anticipate the scenario? What do you think the answer is? That is the answer. The answer is they did. They knew. They knew this was possible. It was logged as a possibility. It was in their scenarios. It was in their models. And yet, we still flew, and it happened. So the big question is, why? 
Why did this happen if we knew this was a possibility? What did we do or didn't we do that would have addressed this particular thing? So these are two gentlemen from NASA who were part of a meeting the night before on January 27th when the um, contractors who made the solid rocket boosters went to them and said, we think we have a problem. We don't think we should fly. Our engineers are telling us that the tolerances for the O-rings for these temperatures are not safe and we should not fly. And the response from NASA was this. George Hardy says, I'm appalled. I'm appalled by your recommendation not to fly. Remember all the political pressure. We've got Kristen McAuliffe going up. We've got all this, this past success. They've had a number of launch missions that were already scrubbed for STS-25, or 51L, right, mission number 25. So there's a lot of pressure going on. Um, uh, Larry Malloy is like, when do you want me to launch, next April? So effectively what happened was NASA convinced the contractors, who were the ones that brought the issue to light, to back off and to agree to do the launch. Right? That's what set things in motion. That was kind of the pivotal moment. So how do we know? We know because we have this committee called the Rogers Commission. The Rogers Commission were the body appointed by the president, President Reagan, to investigate why the shuttle accident occurred. And the Rogers Commission has a number of notable people on it. You've got Neil Armstrong, the first man on the moon. He's right there. You've got Sally Ride. She's the first woman in space. You've got uh, Richard Feynman, who is a Nobel Prize winning physicist. I don't see him in that picture. Um, and you've got, uh, right there is Donald Kutina, who's a general with NASA. These are very significant people. Chuck Yeager, the first man to break the sound barrier. These are really smart people who know how to do this stuff, and they should be the people to really get to the bottom of what's going on. But remember, we're also dealing with politics, right? And one of the problems that is spotted early on is that maybe we're not going to get such a good investigation if all the people are similarly aligned. We don't have a great diversity in this panel in terms of how they can investigate this problem. So there's three really important commission members that I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about Richard Feynman, I'm going to talk about Donald Kutina, and I'm going to give you a special guest at the end to kind of tell you why they're important and you'll figure it out by the time we get there of, of what the significance is. But let's talk about Feynman. So Feynman is a, a Nobel Prize winning physicist. He is not a politician. He can't stand Washington. He's an academic. They invite him to be on the panel because they know that there's this problem with, with you know, whatever went wrong. Or they don't know at this point. So Feynman's like, I don't really want to take this job. Well, Feynman's wife, actually, Edith, or Gwyneth, talks him into it and says, look, if you don't do this, what's going to happen is they're going to have 12 people on a commission that are all going to go around. They're all going to do the same thing. They're all going to come to the same conclusion. If you do it, they're going to have 11 people that are all going to walk around, all come to the same conclusion. They're going to have one guy running around being a pain in everybody's ass, right? And that's you. And he was like, you know what? You're right. So his wife actually talked him into doing it. And it's a good thing she did because he's really the reason that we know what happened today. And it has nothing even to do with physics. Very shaky start for Feynman, though. Immediately, he's rubbing all of the other commission members the wrong way. In fact, Chairman Rogers even said, you are being a pain in the ass. You have to stop. Right? We have processes, we have procedures, but Feynman can't stand it because they're sitting in congressional testimony and they're droning on and on and he's, you know, getting bored or doodling or whatever he's doing. He's trying to pay attention, but he's a, he's a technologist. He wants to talk to people. He wants to talk to the engineers. He wants to figure out what is the problem. And so eventually he tells Chairman Rogers, look, am I allowed to do this? And Rogers goes, well, yeah, you're allowed. He's like, okay, bye. And off he goes. And he starts doing his own thing, um, in the investigation. So, and he also, when he goes around and does this, he makes the first of several critical discoveries. The very first thing he found was very, very poor communication, both at NASA, significantly in NASA, as well as with the contractors that, that dealt with NASA, right? So not so much the engineers. He's going and he's talking to the engineers and he's figuring things out from them. In fact, one of the things he figures out is they have flown 24 flights prior to STS-51L. 24 flights have all flown successfully. 24 flights have also shown the O-rings to be problematic. Why? He said. In fact, he reads a report where it says the O-rings are critical to operation and should be considered a critical system in terms of flight operations. And he said, well, so if you have something that's identified as a critical system and you have something that tells you you shouldn't fly if a critical system is impacted, why are you flying? And the problem he found was because they never talked about it in between their flights. 
They only looked at it in the context of the flight itself. Or let me put it in context for you. When you're working on your projects in your various enterprises, you're never talking about what went wrong between projects. You're only looking at the projects themselves and saying they were fine. So they had 24 past successes, which to Feynman's uh, example is 24 lucky chances. He actually says it this way. He's like, would you play Russian roulette that way? You know there's a bullet in a chamber somewhere. Are you going to pull the trigger again after the first time it misses? And that's really what it was. It was just they were rolling the dice. They were dealing with fate. Second thing he discovers is they have poor risk tolerance. So if a few seals leak but the flight is successful, then maybe the problem isn't so serious. And this is what he's finding. Again, he's looking at their critical system checklists. He's seeing that they had seal failures, but the flights were successful, and the management was accepting this as criteria for success. And he's saying, why are you doing this? If we had critical criteria that say these are critical systems, and they're having problems, why is another one going up after that? It makes no sense, right? We sort of find out the reasons later, but again, we're kind of looking back in time. We're working our way backwards. There's a key moment for Feynman. So Donald Katina, who's one of the generals on the panel, invites Feynman over for dinner, and he brings him out to the garage, and he's like, "Ah, oh, look at my the car that I'm working on." And Feynman knows nothing about cars; he doesn't care. And Katina says, uh, "Yeah, you know, this is my my 1973 Opel, and I'm rebuilding it." And he sees, uh, Feynman sees a bunch of parts that are sitting on a, on a workbench. He's like, well, what are all those parts? Kutina says, oh, that, that, that's a carburetor. He goes, you know what's interesting? Carburetors have rubber seals in them. And, uh, and it's, what I found is whenever I'm trying to operate them in the cold, they don't quite work correctly. Do you think that might have anything to do with, with what we're experiencing? So Feynman's like, oh. And it gives him this idea to pursue the O-rings from Kutina. Now Feynman suggests in his memoirs that he was totally being manipulated by Kutina. After Feynman dies, Kutina confirms it. Completely, he was a puppet master and he was leading him down this path. And there's reasons for that too that we'll talk about. One of the other things that happened was during congressional testimony, four engineers walk into the congressional testimony uh, hearings and they say, well, who are you? And they said, well, we're from Morton Thiokol. We're the contractors who built the solid rocket boosters. And they said, well, you're not on the docket. What are you here to do? And they're like, we're here to testify. So these four people showed up unannounced, uninvited, to testify about the problems that they saw with the, the shuttle and with the, the flight systems. And that's a quote there um, from Alan McDonald. If something goes wrong with this flight, I don't want to stand up in front, front of board and inquiry and say, I thought everything was fine when it's not. And that's why they showed up. And it was very, very significant for the commission. It was kind of a, a turning point for them where they realized that things were not as they seemed because they heard all this testimony from NASA engineer, or sorry, from NASA managers, and they heard all these other testimonies from these people, and they're realizing at this point, things are not lining up. This is a puzzle that cannot be put together. And they're going, why? Why is this happening? So what have we learned so far? We know that there are problems with the SEALs that weren't properly communicated. We know there's problems with the contractors bowing to pressure to NASA. In fact, one of the quotes is uh, the uh, Morton Thiokol uh, managers turn to the engineers and say, look, can you take off your engineer hats and put on your manager hats and help us out? Right? Significant problem. I think I've heard that exact quote in places that I've worked where they've said, stop being so technical, think like a manager. Well, I am, <laughs> right? I'm trying to reduce risk for you. That's what I'm, what I'm being paid to do. And you're not letting me do that, and I don't understand why. We also see that NASA is accepting risk beyond their tolerance. So Feynman's trying to figure out how he can best illustrate this, and he comes up with an idea. So during the next set of congressional testimonies, he has some O-rings that he's, he's acquired. And he's got a glass of ice water, and he takes a, like a rubber clamp, and he twists the O-ring up and puts the clamp on it and drops it in the ice water. And he lets it sit there for about a minute. And he reaches for his microphone because he's going to interrupt the NASA person giving testimony. And Kutina, who's sitting next to him, says, no, 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 wait, just wait. He immediately figures out what's going on. Feynman goes, okay. So he waits another 30 seconds. He goes to go and Kutina goes, no, wait, wait, wait. Okay. So he waits like another minute. He goes to go and Kutina goes, no, no, wait, wait, wait. So Feynman looks at him and Kutina goes, wait until he says this in his testimony. So Feynman does. He waits until that point in the testimony, interrupts. Uh, the, the testimony of the NASA manager, and he says, I believe this has some significance to our problem. He pulls the O-ring out of the glass, takes off the clamp, and it very, very, very slowly starts to go back into an O-ring shape. Now remember what I told you, this has to happen in milliseconds. This is taking seconds or maybe up to a minute to do. This 
is a major point for the media. They immediately grasp the problem. They immediately figure out what's going on, and it causes this big firestorm, which again puts more pressure on NASA to try to explain themselves what's going on, what's happening. Um, but Feynman, kind of a showman, right, was able to, to sort of orchestrate this thing. So there's a lot of political forces that are happening. We've already talked about a few of them. We know that they've got pressure to succeed because of their past successes. NASA kind of has a reputation for succeeding, right? And so they, they are riding their reputation, and reputationally, if they don't make this historic launch, it could cause some seriously bad politics for them. Politics so bad that their funding might get pulled. Remember, when they asked for $14 billion, they only got five and a half. Future funding could be at stake. There's a lot on the table for them. President Reagan had announced in 1986 that the shuttle program will, within a year, put a teacher in space. So they had the pressure of the teacher in space to deal with. The shuttle launch day is the same day as the State of the Union address. Now, Feynman investigates this, and he finds that there's really no correlation between what's going on between um, them choosing to launch the shuttle that day and the State of the Union being the same day. Because the theory is uh, maybe President Reagan wanted to say hello to Krista McAuliffe in space, and they'd have this conversation during the State of the Union. It would be this, this great moment. Here's what I'll suggest. Feynman's probably right. There was no actual order to do that. However, I've worked with people who have ambition and they have ego. And both of those things cause situations like this to happen. So I'm willing to bet there was someone in the organization who was thinking that and was pushing for it for those reasons. It's very likely, but it's obviously hard to prove. So we've got all this media coverage around Krista McAuliffe because she's the first civilian, the first teacher, the first, uh, well, not the first woman, but f first civilian, first teacher in space. And up to now, the, these launches have had problems. And the media is kind of making fun of NASA and questioning how much money they're spending on this program. So again, understand, the 24 successful missions don't mean as much as all of the political pressure that's building as a result. Now, take a step back. Does this sound familiar? you are probably working in these same kinds of circumstances where managers are saying to you, you've been successful before, why can't you be successful now? Because they don't understand those kinds of things. What I'll suggest to you is those same managers are under pressures similar to these that you don't see. And it's causing a disconnect. And the only way to fix that is to, to open your lines of communication. You have to find out what their motivations are and they have to find out what your inhibitors are and we have to bring those together and we have to, to make them work together. That's the first lesson we can learn is those lines of communication are incredibly important. So remember I told you the engineers got up and they testified and one of the things that they had said on the, the night of the launch, the night before the launch when they had the call is they said well how many people disagreed with the launch? And the quote from NASA was well they were roughly evenly divided. So Feynman actually asked the four engineers in the room, he said um, what's your name? I'm Roger Boisjoli. What did you say? I recommended we don't launch. What was your name? I'm here. What did you recommend? We don't launch. What did you recommend that we don't launch? What did you recommend that we don't launch? How could that be evenly divided? Again, significant disconnect in what's going on. The four people who were there, who were the experts in solid rocket booster technology, all said we should not launch. Now that is also a significant thing that we'll find out why later. Um, so Feynman goes, I've got to talk to people. I need to find out what's going on. So he goes to the SRB uh, manufacturing plant. He talks to the people who are building these technologies. And what he finds is they're really excited to talk to him. They really want to tell him all about what they've done and how they've, they've built these things and how this technology works. And he's getting really good vibes from, from these, these um, engineers. He goes to talk to the managers and he's getting a completely different story where he's like, oh, people aren't happy with the way things are going. They don't want to follow the right processes. Um, you know, and he, he gets very confused. He's like, how can you say that? I'm talking to the same people you're talking to. I'm getting a completely different message. Messages are so skewed that we've got numbers like this. The safe, safety estimate, of, uh, sorry, the safety officers estimated the failure chance of being one in 100, so roughly 1%. The safety people at NASA estimated a failure at 1 in 100,000. So that's like 0.001%. Huge difference in those numbers. Feynman actually says, so what you're telling me is based on 1 in 100,000, we could fly a shuttle every day for the next 300 years before we experience a failure. And the answer back was, that's correct. And he's like, are you crazy? 
Every engineer knows your system is going to fail. It's just a question of putting the right parameters around it to say when's it going to fail. Again, I pull you into a modern parallel. It's very likely that you know your systems are going to fail, especially if you're in security. You know security is going to fail. You know it. So you plan for it. You plan contingency. You plan mitigation. You plan all of these other things. Getting that message across is very important, especially when things like this happen, where we start to hear numbers. Like, how about vendor promises? Ever hear a vendor promise a manager something that you couldn't deliver? Right? That's them writing a check that you have to cash. That's a big problem. Right? Same things are happening. Remember, this is 30 years ago. So we're experiencing the same kinds of failures today. Communication, communication, communication. Can't say it enough. All right. So let's look at the actual findings. What do they find? Obviously, they find communication was very poor. The managers had no idea what was going on in either the contractor or at NASA. And what he also finds is the layers between the management all have problems. So messages that are starting at the bottom, by the time they get to the top, it's like that game of telephone where I whisper in your ear and you whisper in yours and yours and yours and it goes all the way around. And by the time it gets to the last person, the message is completely different. That's exactly what's happening here. And it's not so much that there was a bureaucracy problem because the bureaucracy was rather thin in some spots, but there was definitely a communication issue. People were not hearing or they were not speaking or both, right? Um, we also have this issue where um, NASA didn't accept the judgment of its own engineers. NASA's own engineers agreed with the contractors and said, yeah, we think that they're right. We think that the tolerance is actually 53 degrees. If we fly below 53 degrees, that uh, that's going to be a problem. And NASA management said, well, prove it. Prove it to me the night before, keep in mind, right? Okay, how do you fight that? What do you do? Um, right. So the other thing that we have is we have this weird thing called faith in the machine. And this is very much a management kind of philosophy. Now, keep in mind, I was a manager. I was a CISO for a number of years. I understand this. What do they believe about security that there's a big red button that says secure, boom, and we touch it and everything's fine. They inherently trust technology to protect us without realizing that we've got human problems to deal with. The same thing happened at NASA. They completely had faith in their technology because they had this string of success that led up to what eventually was the failure. So they didn't believe the people when the people were going, there's going to be problems because the machines were performing so well. Feynman's quote is, what is the cause of management's fantastic faith in the machinery? And I would say the same thing, but I would change machinery to technology. What is the cause of management's faith in technology? Is it our fault? It's partially. Is it vendor's fault? Partially. Is it management's fault? Partially. Right? We all share the responsibility there, but we can't believe that the technology is going to save us. The technology is what it is. It's a tool. If we don't properly apply the tool, it's not going to help us. Right? That's a problem. We saw the decreasing strictness and preparedness that they found. So the same risk was flown without prior failure. So they're not talking about stuff in between. And this is so, so, so important. When they saw there were problems with the O-rings after the first flight, they should have said, hey, we saw these problems. We need to address them before the next flight. Because remember, human lives are at stake. And here's what I'll suggest. You might not work in an industry right now where human lives are at stake. But medical IoT is a very real thing. Human lives are at stake when we talk about medical IoT. So the same kinds of risk management processes, if we're not looking at failures in our devices that are keeping you know, insulin in diabetic patients, we've got a problem and that needs to be addressed. We also found that they violated stringent rules. Remember when I told you they had a disagreement the night before and NASA basically made them change their minds? Well, that's in violation. There was a 1958 Project Mercury ground rule that said all parties must be in agreement that a flight is safe before we'll put a human in space. So it had been in place for 20 years, well, 10 years, 10 years, 20, 30, right? I can't do math today, right? 20, 25 years, and they opted to violate it because the contractors did say, we're not confident we should fly, we're, we're no go on the flight, and NASA convinced them to change their vote. So effectively, by the letter of the rule, everybody was in agreement, but really not. So when you have something like a baseline rule, it's there for a reason. It's not there to, to change or flex as circumstances see fit. It's there as a control. It's a gateway. And it has to tell us when it kicks in that there's a problem and we have to deal with it. One of the other things they found, which was probably the worst one yet, was the decision to launch uh, belonged to a gentleman by the name of Jesse Moore, who was the flight director for NASA for that mission. And he did not have all the information. He did not know 
that the engineers the night before had said we shouldn't fly. Because had he known that, he would have held to the Project Mercury ground rule and said we're canceling the flight. The flight decision was his and his alone. And based on all of the stations telling him we're A-OK, -okay, we're good to go, they went ahead and set that, that mission up that those seven people died in, right? So you can't blame the flight director. The flight director was not given the information. You have to blame, again, the communication channels that brought the information to the flight director. Why did they fail? Uninformed NASA management is another problem. Um, the high-level managers said that they weren't aware of these things. Well, we didn't know that the O-rings were unsafe below 53 degrees, right? We didn't know that there was all this opposition. And this is happening during congressional testimony. And Feynman, based on his findings, can actually believe this. It's not that they're lying. It's not that they're deliberately misleading. He thinks there's honestly so much problem with their communication that they aren't aware of all of the factors that are actually impacting their ability to execute this, this massive task, right? So what's the ideal world versus reality? Exaggeration, so Feynman says it this way, exaggeration at the top is inconsistent with reality at the bottom, communications got slowed, they ultimately jammed, and then disaster followed. Right. This is probably a very good description of what's happening to you right now. I would, I would you know, wager. It certainly happens to me. It happens to me a lot. Now I'm on the good end of it because now I'm the consultant that gets in to come, come in and say, wow, your commu communications really suck. Let me, let me see if I can help you with that, right? And we try to unravel that spaghetti mess that is, you know, mires us down. But here's the thing. This is the thing probably that makes me most upset about this whole thing. So when, you, when we talk about all the problems that happened, when we talk about all the findings that we found, we found problems in management, we found problems not necessarily with technology, but certainly with our accepting of what that technology could do. The same thing happened again in um, 2003. This is the shuttle Columbia, where seven more astronauts lost their lives for a different reason. It wasn't a solid rocket booster. This time it was heat shielding, um, and the, uh, the shuttle burned up on reentry. But what they found when they investigated the Columbia was the exact same things happen, the exact same failures that led to Challenger also led to Columbia. Why can't we learn? So this is 2003, so this is 13 years ago. My question is, can we learn from this? If we can't learn from 30 years ago, can we learn from 13 years ago? And we have to look at these problems, put them in the same light, and say, we understand that they're there, we acknowledge them, we have to work on fixing them. Right? Because if you just bury it or if you just let it go, that's only going to make the problem worse. And you don't want to head for, for a fatal failure. So how can we make it better? What were the real recommendations of the Rogers Commission? So the first recommendation they had was promote astronauts to management positions. Or, in our terminology, make your subject matter experts manage your operational tasks. Instead of having a manager who may not understand all of the inputs that are going into a given system, have the operational experts who are there manage those things. This is completely possible. You don't necessarily have to promote an engineer to a manager position. You could do that, right? But what you could also do is you could set up a system whereby that manager uses his subject matter experts for their opinions, they're aware of all the inputs, and can make more informed decisions. That is totally possible. On a dynamic team, I'm part of a dynamic wrong in my organization. They could tell me what was wrong for things that they could see that I didn't necessarily have the vision to see. And then I was able to fix problems. That's a great thing. Governance and oversight. When you can split that governance and oversight and you can have that extra pair of eyes that can look at things just a little bit differently, you might make discoveries that you are completely oblivious to because you're right inside what's going on. This is a significant thing too. Try to make this happen. This is actually easier than you think. MacBook is being funny. So another finding was they said establish an advisory panel with representation from many different areas and organizations. Effectively, we call this a steering committee or a security committee or a change advisory board or an architectural review board. These are all words for the same thing. It's this recommendation where we have people from different walks come together, examine what's going on, and decide as a body the direction things should go in. That way, you're sure all of the inputs from all the business people that you're dealing with and all the business processes that you might necessarily have, not necessarily have view into, can be included when they're making these decisions. 
So this is a really, really good thing. If you don't have this today, you should start it. This is the cheapest thing you can do. It's just getting people together to talk about stuff that's in the, in the pipeline and say, how do we deal with this in the pipeline? Specifically with regards to projects, right? If you don't have a, a steering committee for, for projects that are happening in your organization, put them together. Put together a review board and say, let's look at the status of this project right now. Let's look at all the things that have gone wrong, all the things that are going right, and decide together how we can make it do better. Right? It's the cheapest thing you can do, and it's the best use of people's time. And then people feel included, too, which is pretty amazing, especially in security. We tend to operate somewhat you know, in the dark, and people think that what we do is magic, right? and they're afraid of it because it's a little voodoo. But expose it. Open it. Turn the light on Establish an office responsible for reporting and documentation of problems, problem resolution and trends, right? So this is problem management, for lack of a better word. But that's what we need to do. We need to look at root cause analysis. If they had had this, they would have not flown the other missions because they would have seen that they had problems in between the flights and they would have been able to deal with it. So very, very significant way to look at the forward schedule of changes that you have and see how current issues are going to impact those, right? So have some kind of problem reporting or, tr or spe specifically trend reporting. Trend reporting is your friend because it'll show you patterns and anomalies, right? It's just like monitoring a SIM, except that you're looking at it from a business process standpoint instead of a technology standpoint. They recommended changes of personnel, organization, and doctrination, or all three to eliminate isolation. Basically, they're saying shake the tree, kick people out, make them do other things. I don't know that you have the power to do that, but it's okay if, if, you, if you can do this. Right? If you can get people to go in different ways or put people in those positions that haven't been there before, they're going to bring a fresh perspective. It's going to give you ideas and insights that you did not have before, and those will be valuable. So, you know, shake it up. If you can't, if you can't uh, make change, force it. Right? Do what you can. Crowbar it. They recommended to develop a policy which governs imposition and removal of constraints. Remember, the Project Mercury ground rule. Right? It was a hard and fast rule that they were able to take away. So what they said here was, no, 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 put procedures in place that make it really, really hard to take that away. Think of it as uh, we have a, a constitution in the United States. And in order to modify that constitution, we have to go through a process called a constitutional amendment. It's very, very, very difficult to make a constitutional amendment. It's also very, very difficult to rescind a constitutional amendment. And it should be, because those are hard and fast rules that we all have to play by. Right? Now, I'm not going to talk about like the interpretation of those things. That's a little bit different thing. But I'm talking about the actual process. But for you, it's the same thing. Make sure you have some kind of policy which basically says, when we have policies in place, it is not easy to suspend these policies. We have to go through a, a painful process. We have to go to executive management. We have to get business buy-in. Like We have to make this a big deal so people don't just disregard the policy and act as if it never existed in the first place. Okay, make it a painful process. Advocate for that, push for that. If you're in control of it, make it happen. It's very important. This one, I can't say enough about, establish a flight rate consistent with your resources. They were flying way too many shuttle missions in way too small a window. They did not have the proper resources to do all of the things that the commission is recommending. They simply did not. And you probably have this too. You probably have a project pipeline or otherwise where there's all this work. How do you differentiate between keeping the lights on and doing the project work that's coming down when there's so much of the break fix that's happening? You know, I mean, this is a real issue. So being aware of your capacity, in ITIL terms, we call this capacity planning, demand planning, right? Being aware of your capacity and maybe showing it. Maybe if you're overburdened right now, you can actually plot this out in a visual way and you can say, look, Here's my pipeline. I have this much capacity and I have this much work. And you can see I have 150% more work than I have pipeline for. So I'm over allocated. So either everything gets backed up and we wait or we, we increase the pipeline. There's only two options, right? Or we stop the work entirely, which is never going to happen, right? So I guess you have three options, but really two that are viable. But show that. Map it out visually. Show them this is what's going on. That, that could be a significant thing in your favor. Communications must be clear. One of the things that Feynman says when Larry Malloy is testifying is he says, oh, Mr. Malloy explains how the SEALs are supposed to work in the usual way. He uses funny words and acronyms and it's hard for anybody else to understand. Here's my question to you. Are you part of the problem? Because here's what I know. Our industry can have entire paragraphs of conversation using 13 letters of the alphabet. Why? Why does that happen? 
Not only is it a problem for us, it's a problem for outsiders. They don't understand. And it's really bad when it makes them feel dumb. And when they're managers and they're made to feel dumb, that makes your life hard. Break yourself of this. When you are explaining things, when you are communicating, be clear. Do not use acronyms. I do this all the time. Whenever I start a conversation or start a meeting, I'll say, so I'm going to start this meeting. If I use an acronym, please stop me because I'm trying to train myself not to do that. They'll stop me. So if I say something like SIM, they'll stop me and I'll say, oh, I'm sorry, security incident event management. And I use the long words, even though they're long words. It's okay. It's okay to do it when you're with other people. Force that. Force that to happen. Don't be part of the problem. Don't be one of these people who's looked at as, you know, a mystic who's speaking in tongues, right? That's crazy. And then Feynman's fears really echo risk management. So he says, you know, when, when we look at all this stuff, what is the implication that it's going to cause future events to occur in public policy, for example? So for risk management, I would put that on you and I would say, here's the issue that people have with risk management. They start to get involved in it. They start to get a hold of it. They start to investigate it. And then they start to go down rabbit holes. And then they start to go tangential. And then the pile that they, they wind up with is larger than the pile that they started with. And it's a scary thing, right? So where do we go from here is really, really an important part of risk management. A simple assessment, it can wind up causing this entire maze of other issues that you have to deal with. And, you know, we talked about your pipeline already, right? You don't have the pipeline to deal with it. So how do you deal with that? Well, there's a way to do it. I'll talk about it in a minute. When you're doing risk management, you've got forces working against you. You've got economic forces. You've got political forces. You've got ambition. You've got ego. These are all things that are causing you problems. So not just your pipeline, all of these other things that are happening, seek clarification for them. Try to find out if these are things that are impacting you, right? Just simple questions can, can lead you down, down uh, a good pathway. But when these things are happening, when, when we have this sort of question of like, what kind of can of worms am I going to open? And I've got all this stuff working against me. How do I successfully try to manage or at least assess the risk that I have for whatever I'm doing? And the first step you want to do is you want to establish your risk frame. Okay. And this is basic NIST risk management stuff, right? If you look up the NIST um, 800-40, I think. No, 40 is vulnerability management. Whatever risk is, 830, I think, is, is risk. It'll tell you to establish a risk frame. The risk frame for the Rogers Commission, it had three steps. It was review the circumstances surrounding the accident and establish the probable cause or causes of the accident. Develop the recommendations for corrective or other action based on the commission's findings and determinations and complete it in 120 days. That was their charter. That was the backbone of everything they did. So if they had something that was going to take them off a, a rabbit hole, they just looked back here and they said, does it fit into one of these things? And if it didn't fit into one of those things, they ignored it. Or in your case, you save it for the second pass or the third pass or the fourth pass because it's always going to be there, right? Don't worry about it. Don't sweat it. Give yourself a box to work in, work through that first, then come back and do the rest. Risk management is a continuous process and it's, it's hard to do well, but when you can start doing it well, it makes your life immensely easier. And be like Feynman. Feynman was, was a seeker of truth, right? He did not let things bother him that were in the political sphere that he was dealing with. And you kind of got to be that way too. And I'm not saying go crazy because you can't step on a bunch of toes and then expect there to be no consequences. But at the same time, ask questions and don't be afraid to ask questions. And if somebody says, why are you asking these questions? You pull out your risk frame and you go, oh, I'm trying to determine this thing and these are the criteria that I'm working with. When you make it kind of scientific, it pulls that emotion and that politic right out of the discussion and people will tend to talk to you, right? But put thought into action. Try experimentation like Feynman did with his O-ring experiment. You try to, to experiment with things too. Show that there's a problem if you can. Um, deviate from the herd. Explain things to those who don't understand the issues in a way that they're able to grasp. Don't use any acronyms. Forbid yourself. Even tell them I'm forbidden from using acronyms. So if I do or I say a word that you don't know, stop me and I'll explain it, right? Very, very important. Put them at ease when you're having discussions with people. All right, so we talked about two people who are very significant. Richard Feynman, who really is the mouthpiece. He is the one who is driving everything. And Feynman's kind of a showman, so that's great. We've got Kutina, who is the puppet master. Kutina knows something has occurred. Do you know why he knows something has occurred? Because he has a mole. He has a mole inside NASA. He has somebody who has given him information. He described it this way. I was walking down the hall 
and this person was walking beside me, never looked at me, reached into a binder and handed me a piece of paper without ever looking at me. I looked down at the piece of paper, and what I saw were two columns on the paper. The title of it was O-rings. One was the temperature, and the other column was the tolerances, and it showed right there that they failed under 53 degrees. This was a NASA internal memo. Do you know who his mole was? It was Sally Ride, another commission member. Sally was still working for NASA. She was an astronaut, and she had a lot of astronaut friends, and they all knew that if this got out, they would be fired or worse. So they orchestrated this system where they were able to push information up to her. She was able to laterally pass it to Katina, who was able to introduce it to Feynman, who took the clue, ran with it, and they were able to do what they need to do. This is devious and crafty and wonderful. And if you can do this, you are a master of your craft. Okay? Just be careful. You can't manipulate people. But you may need information. So you may need to probe. Or you may need to say to somebody, hey, if you ever see this occur, let me know or let them know, or whatever, and orchestrate something that will get you the information that you need to properly assess, frame, and manage your risk. Because at the end of the day, that's really what you're doing, is you're taking risk, you're putting it in a bottle, and you're saying, all right, we know about that, we're going to contain that, and we're going to deal with all, everything that's residual. Right? That's really what your job is at the end of the day. Feynman says, for sex successful technology, reality must take precedence over public relations, for nature cannot be fooled. And basically what he's saying is, we know stuff's going to fail, and when it does, we'd better be ready for it, because if we fool ourselves into thinking it won't, we are wrong, right? It will fail. Every engineer will tell you their product will eventually fail. There is no engineer that will certify the product will run 100% of the time, all the time. So before I close, I want to talk about this man, Bob Evely. Bob was one of these engineers that testified. And when the shuttle disaster happened, the day it happened, Bob went into a Great Depression. He basically quit his job and really could not deal with the fact that these people had died. He took it very, very, very personally. And he said, I am responsible for these people's deaths. He actually went so far as to tell his wife that the night before, when they were having the disagreements with NASA, he was considering going and getting his hunting rifle and walking into Houston and holding up the launch with a rifle. Right? Bob was very, very personally involved with the issue. And here's what I'm going to say. I've worked with a lot of people over the years, a lot of security people, and security people get very emotionally attached to their projects, to their technology, to the things that they're contributing to the organization, probably because they realize what the impact it, of it is. And Bob had, to, had basically to go through 30 years of guilt and pain and depression, thinking that he was the cause of this. Shortly before his death, which was this year, the beginning of this year, Several people, including Alan McDonald, came out and said, it was not your fault. We were in full go mode. Nothing was going to change that. There's nothing you could have done. And basically put him at rest or at ease until he passed away a couple of months later. So my, my sort of forecast to you is, don't be so emotionally attached to these things that they will impact you in this way, that they cause you grief, that they cause you suffering, that they cause you depression. Understand there are times when there are things that are completely out of your control and the best you can do is to frame it, illustrate it, present it, and then let the dominoes fall the way they will. That's the best you can do. Those are my references. That's all I have for you. Thank you very much. Do you have any questions? So if you're interested, um, all this information that I pulled out of here, I basically pulled from two sources. One was the Rogers Commission report itself, um, which gave me the idea for the talk. During the 30th anniversary, I read a, a media article, and it, it's published online. And I went and I read the document. It's really not that hard to read. And I was just shocked by the parallels in it, shocked at the things that they were recommending. I'm like, I could literally template this and hand it to, to organizations today and say, here, follow these, these rules. They're the same rules. Um, and then the other was one of Fen uh, Feynman's uh, memoirs, which is, uh, I think it was Are You Listening, Dr. Feynman? which is just a fascinating read, and probably half of it's lies, but it's still very, very interesting and, and interesting. Oh, by the way, um, so with Kutina and Sally Ride, when Sally Ride gave him this document, he swore he would never reveal her identity, and it wasn't until 2012 when she died that he actually said, yeah, it was Sally Ride who gave it to us. So pretty interesting thing there, too. Thank you very much.